Sign up with my bookie and use our promo code Gators to get your first ever deposit match dollar for dollar. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Want more Gators Breakdown? Join Gators Breakdown Plus. Starting at $3 a month, get access to unique episodes, plus a blog, chat room, giveaways, shout outs, and more. Gators Breakdown Plus is furthering the interaction with fans and listeners like you. Head to GatorsBreakdown.SupportingCast.FM to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. Certainly not a dull moment right now in Gator Nation. So much going on with the firing of Dan Mullen, and now the coaching coaching search in full swing for the Gators. I am David Waters, host of Gators Breakdown. You can find me on Twitter, at GatorDave underscore SEC. Plenty, plenty to get into here as we are coaching search mode even uh fsu coming up this week we're, uh, we know but i'm not going to bury the headline the, the the main topic is the coaching search going on now uh as you know we're a day removed uh from dan mullen being fired at the university of florida so plenty plenty to get into to help me this episode we took it together pretty fast today had to put it together pretty fast you guys if you've been around for a while you know who he is but there he is, Bill Sykes, back on That's the right. break down. There we go. There we <laughs> I'm, I'm go. back like Jimbo Fisher's hairline, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we look, we've had this in the works. Uh, and then Will Miles was supposed to be on tonight, but Will's on vacation and had some internet issues and stuff. So uh, I was going to do an episode tonight anyway, but I was like, let me just go ahead and reach out to Bill. See, uh, see, see if Bill can uh, – look, the, Bill's schedule is all kind of crazy with work and family and stuff, but luckily – Bill was on vacation this week, so I'm ruining Bill's vacation. Um, oh, I was going to try and ruin Will's vacation too, but uh, he's got the internet uh, internet issues there. So, Bill, man, glad to have you back on. Uh, all the old timers know you. Some of the all the new listeners we've had in the last couple of years, yeah, you've been on, you know, here or there. Uh, I've been a few times, times, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it's uh, good to be back, back though, man. man. Yeah, it's like riding a bike, man. You'll you'll fit right in. Yeah, you know, the first thing I'm going to say, man, you've really stepped up your background game. Like, here yeah. I am. I'm in a new house. I, I, my family and I were still unpacking boxes. It looks like clockwork orange behind me, you know. <laughs> hey, it's a funny story. I mean, hey, it's coming full circle. The day, remember, the day Dan yes. Martin was hired was when I moved into this this house. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You were, man. And, you know, yep. it wasn't too long before that that I was, like, broadcasting from a, a hotel or an apartment or something like that. But, but yeah, I mean, I had a chance to help Zillow go out of business, so I had to move. But, <laughs> but yeah, it looks great, man. You look all professional now. It's, you've done a great job with the show. I missed a good Dr. Will, too. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, get, we'll have to get back on when, when all three of us can get together for sure. Uh, but yeah, everybody know if, if you're not familiar with Bill, Bill's got the reputation for following recruiting, diving into recruiting uh, like nobody else out there. Had to take some time off away from the podcast, so you still get him on here every now and then, but no, no better chance, no better opportunity uh, than right now with what's going on out there in Gator Nation and, and, and Florida searching for a, a new head coach after uh, Dan Mullen gets fired. So Bill, we got plenty to get into. We'll get into to Dan Mullen, your thoughts, uh, of course, uh, why it didn't work out. And I mean, we'll know where you'll go with it and where we went with it. But, uh, you know, there's we'll, a lot we'll get of options, it. Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, look, we don't, uh, you know, don't take solace in somebody losing their job and getting fired. But there, there are reasons it happened. We'll get into all that. We'll get into some more candidates talk uh, as well. Uh, of course, uh, a lot made of this morning on the Twitter spaces, uh, a lot of Billy Napier talk out there, and that continued uh, today all throughout Gator Nation. Uh, and also uh, just tying, tying this all, all these candidates into recruiting. Bill's got some – he posted it on the 24-7 sports board uh, earlier today, sent it my way as well. And we'll get into all that, as for, of course, because we know how important recruiting is um, to the game of college football – how it can sustain a college football coach's career. And uh, we'll get into that. Bill's got, they've got some nice breakdowns there. So, Bill, you ready to get this started? Oh, hell yeah. 
<laughs> anything you want to say before we get started? You know, we'll get into the mulling everything there, but uh, anything, anything else? Man, I, you know, just it's been a crazy three years. I wish I had been wrong, and um, mm. but I kind of saw this coming for a long time. Uh, but shout outs to, to you and the Gators Breakdown crew, all the podcaster, David Sotoquist and Dustin Stats, the posse over 24 7, all the guys who, you know, kind of kept it real with us because I caught a lot of heat kind of marching into the zombie horde with some unpopular things. But I really appreciate those people who kept saying, speak your conviction, stick to the facts and stuff like that. And I, I really appreciated the support from you and a lot of people out there, Blake Alderman, um, Corey Bender, all those guys. Yeah, Bill, uh, Albert the Gator in the YouTube chat says stars don't matter. So <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure shirts are a, a good, hey, you know what? Joke, lighthearted here's, joke right there. here's the thing. Stars don't matter if you were prepared to take a $12 million buyout and a long vacation after three or four years. <laughs> You're right. They don't. If you get that job, it's a great job. You can, you can run it into the ground and then go to Hawaii. So yeah, I guess they don't. And that matters. <laughs> All right. So. Yeah, Bill, let's get into it. Of course, like we said, you know, don't want um, to make lighthearted, fun joke of, you know, Dan Mullen uh, being fired. I, look, we all wish it had worked out, uh, for, first and foremost. When he was hired, uh, we, we, the on the field acumen, the coaching acumen, we were all speaking very highly of that. But we all did have the question would the recruiting ever get to the level uh, it would be good enough uh, to compete with Kirby Smart in Georgia and Alabama and, and Nick Saban and the rest of LSU and um, uh, Ed Orgeron and everything that's going on there, you know, would it be to that level where he could consistently compete for, for, for titles? And now four years, no SEC titles, one SEC East crown, no college football playoff appearance. Look, we know it's not easy, but there was a path there. And Billy never was going to get close to that path, in my mind, with the way the recruiting played out. Yeah, it's just a matter of a bad root leads to bad fruit. It's just that simple. And that that's why I was so sure that this probably wasn't going to happen. Anything can happen. History can be made. But from the very get-go, the hires were bad. The staffing was bad. The organization was bad. The strategy was bad heading out to the West Coast. Uh, the communication was poor. I mean, I had top 50 players, parent, reach out to me. I think Jordan Battle, if you guys remember him, and he was like, I asked him, I was like, you guys coming to Florida? And he was like, we love Florida. Uh, we'd love to be there, but this thing is so disorganized. We don't even know who his lead recruiter is. And, and I had to turn around and send that to Lee Begley. And I'm like, hey, you might want to get a hold of this. And that's that was when things were – it was pretty controversial at the time because it was the bump cycle. He was putting together a mirage of a class and that was nowhere near as good as he kind of made it look. Uh, and it even looked great, even on paper. Um, it, it was just bad all the way around the way he approached recruiting, and it was just bound to fall apart at some point. Yeah, Bill, and now we, we we fast forward to year four, and Florida sits at five and six. You know, Dan Mullen was the head coach for 11 of these games. Gators sit at five and six. Uh, but you know, I keep trying to, you know, on various radio interviews and different podcasts and going on, and, like, it's not just about the, the, the five and six record, you know, this year. It's about the collapse of 2020, uh, the direction of recruiting, uh, the, the trend. I don't think he was ever going to dig himself out of this hole, even if, you know, you, you were going to – you know, sit here and possibly if he had done better toward the end of the season, okay, he saves his job and now he goes makes a defensive coordinator hire, makes an offensive line hire, defensive staff hire, probably with a new coordinator coming in. But to me, it was always going to start and stop at the top uh, with, with the recruiting direction under Dan. He wasn't just going to magically change or, or wave a magic wand and it automatically just get better uh, on the recruiting trail. And as you mentioned, you've laid out plenty of issues. We We've heard about the issues the last four years of uh, of recruiting, and as you said, the communication from um, you know the, the support staff and, and recruiting department, and that, that had gotten better throughout the years. Probably nowhere near the level it should have been, but it did get better. They did address the issues somewhat uh, there, and they they had a a few good guys and and people involved in that, but not enough. Uh, and then, Bill, I always just go back to man, and I know we, we hit it hard. We've hit it hard for years just not able to take advantage of FSU, Miami being down, and those you beat them head-to-head in 18 and 19. And still, it didn't stop Alabama and Ohio State and Clemson and Georgia and uh, all other kind of I – mean, Oklahoma's been getting prospects out of the state of Florida as well. It, that You never closed down the state. And that was, the I think, the biggest issue when you, it was set up on a tee for you 
you were winning head to head, you were winning on the field, you were playing well. You have to take advantage of that. You have to go sell that. It's not going to sell it for you. Just because you're winning, is that, that's not going to do it. You have to go sell that, and it never happens. Well, and the thing is, you don't have to even lock down the state. I mean, you generally got 40 yeah. to 50 blue-chip prospects in the state of Florida every year, but you've at least got to take your share. And it was so bad that players just didn't – the elites didn't want anything to do with Dan Mullen. They didn't want anything to do with this organization. It, the culture that he instilled, it emanated down from the top. It was just a, a lackadaisical, lazy, disorganized mess. And that emanated out into other parts of the program. I mean, it just kind of always felt like he was just going to do what he's going to do, and I'm just going to call some magical plays, and it's going to be all right. But that's just not life in the SEC. That might be life in Montana or in New Hampshire, but that's not the way it works in the Deep South. Um and you look at any part of that program when it got to the end here, and this is what I started asking people towards the end. I'm like, what aspect of this program is emanating championship excellence? We're talking about process here. Was it clock management? Nope. Depth chart decisions? Nope. Staffing? Nope. The way he treats rivalries? Nope. I mean, you go on and on and on and on, and it, you don't even have to get around to recruiting. But the problems that I saw there were actually the same problems that were seeping into other parts of the program. Because like you said, it all starts with Dan Mullen. It's the way he was doing business and it was a failing process in every part of the program. Yeah. And Bill, that's where I go. Like, you know, I, I, I came around on the recruiting side of it slower than you did. I, I came around, I came around pretty early on it, you know, cause a lot of the work you did and a lot of the work Will did. And, you know, I, I jumped on board. I probably, had some orange and blue glasses on for a little longer. <laughs> than That's part of the fun, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I still had the thought of it's got to get better. I guess yeah. where I thought was it would get better. But I, and I knew if it didn't, then where we're at right now was going to happen. Uh, I just thought it would get better. I think that's probably where I, I stood with it and, and hung on for a little bit. But there you go. My biggest issue was in this five and six year, and people have heard me you know, say this over and over again, the things we were always able to count on, not being able to count on anymore. Like you said, the game management, the clock management, uh, uh, winning close one score games as he did early in his tenure. Uh, and there was a, an upward trend in 2018 and 2019. You were winning games. You were winning games more so than the, than the previous staff. But as I always kept saying, eventually you're going to have to move on, move away from it's better than it was before eventually you're going to have to just get over that championships are the goal. We were all happy. We all had fun those first three years under Dan Mullen, but okay, it's fun. Now go win some titles and the collapse of 2020, <laughs> that, that shoe throw, that LSU game, the bowl game versus Oklahoma. Uh, yeah. You had that, you know, an Alabama performance that was sandwiched in there, but Bill, as you said, there was just nothing I could point to as 2021 started playing out to where I felt confident that it was just going to get done. Right. And, you know, man, it's one thing, kind of like getting back to your other point, it's not just that he didn't win a title. It's just everything was going the wrong direction. If the guy was landing classes that were close, six, yeah. seven, eight, knocking on, on the door of that championship standard of top five or five-star quarterback, you kind of give him a pass and say, well, maybe he pops one. Maybe his – play calling acumen does make the difference. But when it's going from fourth to fifth, the sixth in the SEC, and it just keeps slipping down the, the, the hill there, that's bad. And then even in game, it was always something. Special teams was consistently bad. You know, he shows up to Georgia with the wrong armbands. You have eight false starts against Kentucky. You have the shoe throw against LSU. It was just always something that was a fly in the ointment. And it's like if one of those things happen, you say, that's bad luck. When it happens on a consistent basis, you say, that's a bad coach. And ultimately, I think that's the problem. You know, a lot of people will point to re recruiting and say, well, see, yeah, recruiting is not the problem. It's all those other things. Well, if recruiting was better, those eight false starts may not matter as much. Right. <laughs> you may not be in a position where a shoe throw loses you a game. I mean, that, that's kind of where it goes, you know, where, where we go with these things is you can afford some mistakes if that talent level is up there. And if, and if it was, since it wasn't, it goes back to your point where it wasn't close enough to where you know, the play calling could really just take over and you go win titles based on that. That was the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People oh, always say that yeah. every time that he's ever lost the game and the same thing with Mac went before him, they'll come to me and be like, see, this wasn't recruiting. Here's what you can understand about recruiting. And, and for fans that want to kind of keep this in mind, moving forward, recruiting sets both your ceiling and your floor relative to coaching. 
it's kind of a sliding scale. The better a coach, it's going to inch up. But historically, if you're talking about winning championships, no team since at least the early 90s has won the SEC without a composite top five class or pre-composite pre-2002 or a five-star quarterback. Nobody. Nobody. It just hasn't happened. And so though that's the standard to, to win the championships. But any team can upset any other team on any given Saturday. So if you're talking about avoiding those Kentucky losses or the bad, yeah. you know, the Sanford games, that can happen to anybody, but that better talent does insulate you and takes the burden off of the need for excellent play and excellent coaches, even in those situations. And so as your talent level slips out of that top five to top 10, and really I think it's kind of miragey where they sit now in the composite because all these retread transfers and some of these bad takes he's had, guys with major injuries that haven't been able to contribute much. When you when you start sliding down that list, you leave yourself open because ultimately, you know, talent uh, or excuse me, coaching beats talent when talent's not coached. Usually not even then, though, you know, and it's just that sliding scale. So the better your talent, the less of those upsets you're going to have and the more chances you're going to have to win the championship. Ah, there we go. Like I said, we wish it would have worked out. You know, it, it, it just didn't. Uh, and time to move on. Florida will make another hire uh, here. And that's, you know, kind of what we'll get into here uh, for the rest of this episode. But, Bill, anything else, man, on, on, on Mullen and the process and, and just, you know, how, how it played out? And I mean, look, we, we, we always go back to, you know, the record versus Georgia, one and three, the one and three record versus LSU, two and two versus Kentucky, um, lost to A&M last year. I mean, I guess his best win was what twenty twenty versus Georgia. Uh, I guess you, you go back and look at that in twenty eighteen LSU. I mean, not not a lot of marquee wins in four years either. No, and it was becoming more and more Mississippi State like. I mean, I, you know, I'm ready to move on. Um, you know, I promised the on this show when we went over and he was hired that night. I said, I promise I will not make any cousin Eddie references as long as he's a coach. But by cousin Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> The holidays are coming up. Hey, I consider my oath fulfilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, let's get into uh, what's next. What's next for Florida? A lot of candidates out there, a lot of hot boards, a lot of names. Uh, this won't necessarily be a quote-unquote hot board show. You know, we'll, we'll throw candidates out there. We'll throw some names. I've already done that uh, a couple times there as well. But uh, Billy Napier, uh, Lane Kiffin. Your boy Hugh Freeze, and I don't, I'm going to let you sell that one pretty. I'm going to let you sell that one really hard. Uh, there, uh, of course, Mario Cristobal. You know, name name will come up as well. Um, Bill, I put it out on Twitter, and there there's the names out there. Where is there anybody not discussed? And we'll get into the names that we know. But is there anybody out there under the radar that's kind of just you know maybe not being talked about enough? that you, you, you'll throw out there before we get into the meat. Well, I, you know, I don't want to be quoted as saying I think this guy is a serious candidate because it would be a total dark horse, you know, for the ages. Uh, but my number one candidate in 2015 and was actually Brian Kelly. And uh, the, the, I don't think that happens. I don't think he's necessarily even a good culture fit. But, you know, people kind of went going over and over about how uh, Strickland was mentioning sustained success. And you talk about a guy that maybe if he does have aspirations of moving south, I don't know if he's in a tax-free state as far as income tax, or maybe he wants a chance to, to win it at the biggest level and has some gas in the tank. Maybe there he wants you go, to- Bill. Yeah, before you go further with that, the I can honestly say, I can see him saying, I've hit my ceiling at Notre Dame. Yeah, I and I think he win, has. I cannot win a national championship here. Yeah, a friend of mine at work, his name is Chris Morris. He's a huge Notre Dame fan. We talk about it all the time. And, uh, you know, he he is very happy with Kelly. I don't think he has any illusions that he's going to become a Nick Saban there or maybe never even win a title. But they're, they're primed for a chance to sneak into the playoffs every couple of years if things go exactly right for them. And, I, you know, I don't think you can really ask much more of a Notre Dame coach at this point. Yeah, so, you, you know, you're not – the before people go crazy, you're not saying that should be the no. higher, that will be the higher. No, no, no. Before people, you know, go off the deep end there. That's just I'm, I'm thinking, but we all know the hot names that are out there. I'm saying the ones that are not out there, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring them up here. Uh, so, of the likely candidates, Bill, 
I mean, Billy Napier, Lane Kiffin, Mario Cristobal, Luke Fickle. Uh, those, those are the the names you hear thrown around the most uh, for this Florida job, especially on this Monday, the day after Dan Mullins fired Billy Napier's name way up there, way up there. Uh, and I, I have some stuff from earlier today that I'll share in this episode as well uh, as far as Napier goes. But uh, what intrigues you about a, a, a Billy Napier, Lane Kiffin, Mario Cristobal, Luke Fickle? We'll get into it. I know it starts with recruiting, but you know, what, what intrigues you about those guys? Well, I think it all goes back to what I think that this program needs. And I, I keep posting this. I keep telling friends this and coworkers when they ask me. The thing that Florida needs right now is to transform its football program into a recruiting organization first and foremost. I am to the point, and, and listen, I know people might take this as always oh, emboldened because Mullen got fired. That's not it. I, I just am to the point where I almost feel like 70, 80 percent of the college football championship race is won on the recruiting trail. I just feel like, yes, you do need coaching. Yes, you do need these other aspects, program management. There is a lot that goes into it, but it's just so irreplaceable. It's so important and so foundational to have these elite talent clusters and talent bases that I just feel like Florida's got to change the way it does business to start drawing these elite classes. And people want to talk about facilities, and I'm not saying they don't help, and they want to talk about bags and all this stuff. Um, there was a poster – on the rival side that was posting about his son's visit to Georgia recently. And he was just talking about all the little differences. And this is a Gator fan. And he was just saying that like, you know, at Florida, you go on an unofficial visit and they give you a hot dog at the other place. They've got a giant mound of everything you could ever want from Chick-fil-A, just these little differences, you know, and you, you go to Georgia and they've gone around the rules a little bit, you know, cause recruits can't be on the field. And, but, I can't remember who told me this, that they, or I read it somewhere, they carved out a concrete area that led right up to the field, you know, outside the box, of course. But they're, they're looking for every advantage to make recruits a part of the experience, to welcome them, to, to get them there. Florida's got to become that type of program. They've got to look for every advantage. So I think they need a creative, transformative leader who is going to shake the trees at the admin level and at the booster level and say, this is what it takes. It's not always about the giant facility. I'm not saying they don't need their that or shouldn't do that, but they need somebody who's going to relentlessly pursue excellence and look for every possible advantage and every means of growth in recruiting. Because if they don't get the type of talent that they need to thwart a Georgia and to narrow that gap to where coaching can make the difference, it's not going to matter. And so along those lines, I'm looking for process oriented recruiters. And so what I mean by that is I, I'm not so worried that this guy is like the greatest salesman we've ever seen. I want a guy who's going to come in and change the game and say, this is some, here's an avenue and I can put somebody on this in my organization to make a difference and get this extra guy. Because if they can get those extra three, four or five guys a class, it'll make a tremendous difference. And so I'm looking for guys like Billy Napier. Um, I don't know, honestly, I mean, we can talk about Hugh Freeze in a little bit. I know he recruits his butt off, but uh, I want guys that are going to go out there and change the game. Uh, Fickle may be that, and we'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. Chris Doble, Cristobal may, may be uh, that as well, but that's the type of individual that I'm looking for to come in the program. Yeah, Bill, and, and, and you know, Florida themselves, the Florida school, Florida the administration, Florida the athletic department, Scott Strickland, they got to be on that same page as well, you know, and uh, that you know, this is a this is a top down, I think, blank slate for everybody. You know, don't everybody's been sharing the heck out of the the quote from Billy Napier: "Scared money don't make money." Uh, the, yeah. the last couple of days, and just take it away from him. I mean, that just applies to Florida the program uh, right, right now as well. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we've talked recruiting budgets. We've talked, uh, quote, unquote, bags, if you want to go bags. You know, however you want to define money in football, in recruiting, it's going to play a part. You know, and everybody needs to be on the same page, not just about money, too. As you said, communication. Everybody needs to be on the same page moving forward for Florida right now, whether it be administration, athletic director, recruiting office recruiting staff the head coach the assistant everybody needs to be on the same page uh for recruiting going forward and that's it's it's a different way of doing things but 
you're going to have to bring somebody who's been through that process, who has seen the, 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 the best do it, do it, have done it themselves. There's a, diff- a lot of ways, a lot of candidates out there that, who have done it different ways. And, and, and they've learned through different um, of don't, don't do, learn different ways to do it from the best out there by either becoming the best themselves and doing it out there, like somebody like Crystal Ball, who's dominated the Pac-12 in recruiting, or somebody like Napier, who has learned from Dabo and, and, and Saban throughout the years and then applied it to uh, what he's done at Louisiana in the Sun Belt, you know, to a lesser extent. But he's put a process there equal to his peers or better than his peers uh, out there uh, to, to be recruiting against. So, yeah. Hey, one, one thing real quick, Dave, you, yeah. you know, we, and I'm not going to get into the bags discussion, but um, when it comes to bags facilities, all these things that fans point to is things that are insurmountable for whatever coach is in there, like kind of the excuses why we can never expect him to do this. Here, here's my question. Let's pretend for a moment that Florida never cheats and that Georgia, and I'm not saying they do, but if, that Georgia's paying millions for these recruits, okay? And let's pretend that Florida's got the worst facilities in the world and Georgia has the best facilities in the world. If that's the case, can we afford a guy that's taking vacation when other staffs are out visiting people? Can we afford a guy not to look for every single advantage that doesn't cost those bags and facilities? And that's kind of my point. Whatever the situation is with those things, we need a guy who maximizes what Florida does offer and provide as advantageous to the recruiting effort. He needs to look under every rock, every stone, and just find those advantages. And they are there. There are ways to get out there and maximize what what Florida has. It can get better, and I think it's going to get better. I think they're about to bring somebody in that's going to fix it. All right, so, Bill, the hot name is, and we'll get into the way you broke it out uh, for a lot of these candidates here, uh, looking at the recruiting side of it. But hot topic, we'll get into it. Uh, the, the hot name, I'm not going to you know bury the lead here uh, for, for, for this day after, but Billy Napier is the hot name out there. I uh, had a Twitter Spaces uh, th- this morning, and, and luckily, uh, sometimes it pays to be lucky. Uh, I had uh, uh, Josh from um, – the Rage and Review podcast, uh, and it covers Louisiana, where Billy Napier is. And he jumped in, and he does a podcast just like I do, Gators Breakdown here, and covering uh, that program and really had some nice things to say uh, about Billy Napier. And it kind of caught fire this morning. Uh, and so you can go listen to the full episode. Uh, y'all, I'll give you a little snippet, little preview here. You can listen to uh, the rest of it on there. Of course, after you listen to this episode, uh, but uh, a lot, uh, a lot of good things, a lot of positive mentions here uh, for one Billy Napier. I would say this: I, I, I know that there's interest from the Napier camp. I know that for a fact. I, I can't say much on it, but yeah. I know Napier's interested in your job. Uh, for your listeners, you're going to hear Baton Rouge media try to push the Napier to LSU narrative. It's not true. There is not interest from Napier to Baton Rouge. So if you guys get into it with some of those Tiger fans over there, just know <laughs> they're delusional on multiple levels. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with that. But um, uh, for from our perspective, we think that Napier to Florida is a perfect fit, knowing the man for the last four years. I think his culture, the way that he builds culture and programs and the way that he treats his people and his players – I think that it would be a home run for Florida. I think it's a home run for Napier. And to be quite honest, it's a home run for us because uh, not very often does a, a guy like Napier have the chops from Dabo, from Saban, come down to a, a smaller school like us, build a Sunbelt powerhouse, and then jump to an SEC job, a perennial power SEC job. So we think it's great for all parties involved, and uh, we hope it happens, and we'll be watching. Well, that's good to hear, man. Great. Uh, thanks for uh, hopping in. So, uh, no, it's um, – do you think for the whole LSU side of it, you know, could it be some of the behind-the-scenes stuff that, that goes on at LSU that we've all heard about that doesn't really get put out in the public a whole lot because uh, the, the media does seem to do a pretty good job of burying a lot of the issues at LSU. Could that be a reason why or is, just, you know, no, is, there, is there no mutual – is there no interest from the LSU side? Or is it just more on the on the nature side, not being interested in LSU? There's definitely the Title IX issues, the FBI pending investigation. It's it's worse than even the state media here. No, I mean, yeah, it, the depths are pretty substantial. Uh, if you know Billy at all, he is a character guy. He's a people man. Yeah, he's a family. Man. He's a family man, and he values job security. 
one thing that you're never going to get at LSU is job security. Uh, you know, these guys just won a national championship 22 months ago and they fired their guy. And not only did they fire him, they, they thought that it would be good to humiliate him on the way out. So I think that Napier and his family see that. Uh, I don't think he needs any of that in his coaching life. That, that guy's got a sterling reputation. There's, I, that is my personal opinion. Uh, I think that Woodward's looking for a splash, as he always does. I think they have a guy that's on the hook right now. I don't know when it'll be announced. But Napier was further down the list um, from the beginning. Yeah. I know Nape, Nape, uh, there's some interest between TCU and Nape and uh, also supposedly from Blacksburg. Uh, but obviously Florida would trump those jobs if they thought that he was the guy. So um, those are the three that, in my, in my view, and what I know of the situation would be uh, his landing spots. But, you know, I, to be quite honest, uh, I didn't think Mullen would get fired. I, and I know the last couple of weeks have kind of really accelerated the process. But uh, I thought that if he kind of, you know, stabilized the ship and, and went, got some W's on the way out uh, of this season in 2021, I thought he would survive it. Uh, but, I mean, obviously you had to make a move. That thing was done. I mean, this ship was crashing. <laughs> Into, you know what I mean? It, it was over. Um, yeah, that's that, that's part of it. You know, the – the as I said, like the, the South Carolina game kind of started it. Right. Probably still would have been safe beating Missouri and, and, and Florida State. Now, I think if you knew what you wanted to do, you go ahead and make that move. Uh, but I agree, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, the collapse and the speed of it is really uh, something to behold uh, when you look at how, how it all went down. But uh, as you said, you know, job security and all that kind of stuff. And uh, some people have worried that about Florida too, you know, switching coaches every every four years. And if, you know, if Napier is interested, hopefully that doesn't hurt uh you know the whole job security issue thing uh doesn't hurt there as well sure sure and look if you if you have any type of time on your hands go back and look at the interviews that he gave when he got here and even into his his tenure at louisiana he has almost always made a point to say that job security was important uh he tells an anecdotal story about when he when Dabo decided to to let him go uh, the worst feeling he ever had was he had to go home to Allie, his wife, and say, uh, we don't, we're not employed anymore. And he talks about that regularly. So I know, uh, you know, our fans down here understand that job, job security is at the top of his list. He's not chasing money. He's not chasing glory. I can tell you that. He's chasing job security. He wants to win a national championship, and he wants his family to be comfortable while he's doing it. So, uh, you know, if you guys have any sway, I would, I would – Highly encourage you to push your administration to do the right thing. Billy's the guy for you guys, in my opinion. Uh, and I only say that because, look, I know we all know down here that the day was coming well, where, when he would leave. And we, th there's a pretty strong belief around here that this is, this is the, the time. So if he will end up somewhere other than Lafayette, Louisiana, I hope it's in Gainesville. There we go. Some good stuff there. Some nuggets there shared this morning on the Gators Breakdown Twitter Spaces chat there. So a lot of positive information there for, for, for Billy Napier there. And Bill, it, it is kind of funny bringing up job security and you know, Florida has cycled through coaches uh, mm -hmm. there. And it's it worth bringing up, uh, I, I, I think. But as we said, looking back at Mullen, it was more of a program trajectory, program direction uh, type of move here, not because he's losing games in year four, uh, but some uh, really positive look there at, at Billy Napier that really, really sold a lot of fans today. Yeah, I, I like the idea of the guy. Like I said, I think he's a process guy, and I think he's a, a college coach through and through, and I, I, I just love these up-and-comers like him and, and what he seems to be looking for. Now, how much of this is jockeying? I think your guy – I yeah. obviously had some really good insight there and I hope he's getting accurate info. It sounds like he is um, because if he's looking for a school like Florida and Florida is looking like a, for a school like him, I would love the idea that Florida got their guy. And it, cause last time it kind of felt like they had to go down the list, almost like the one they did with Zook. You know, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But I'm all about it. I mean, he's, he's a guy that at least shows the chops to win championships, to recruit and make an impact in recruiting in the, Hey, let's do that. Let's improve this roster, change the culture, and let's go from there. Bill, I want you to go further with that because I, I – and, you know, I'll, I'll extend it. It does look like the conversations may have – was it? it didn't start today. The conversations have been going on for 
about a couple weeks now, two two and a half weeks here uh, behind the scenes here with, uh, with with Billy Napier. Uh, that's why it looks like it's moving a little fast today on this Monday. It uh, I've confirmed it with some other Louisiana people. Uh, and on the Florida side, that the two sides are meeting. Now, I don't know if that means Napier's involved in the meeting, but at least the uh, Florida administration and an agent meeting uh, at the base of it. Uh, the two sides are talking, uh, Billy Napier's side and Florida. So, but Bill, going to your point there, you know, it looks like this thing's moving kind of fast. And I throw caution a little bit at that. You know, for a lot of these first names out there don't usually work out in these coaching searches. But I want you to explain your thought process of going with the young up and comer and why that might be uh, better and why that might signal uh, a you chasing a championship more so than like an established Dan Mullen, where you know you, you get the play caller, you wonder about recruiting, but how this could turn out better. Well, kind of, you know, building on what I mentioned before, they need to change and, and they need to modernize the Florida football program. Um, and I, but I want somebody that's hungry to do that. Recruiting is not yeah. easy. I mean, it, you know, when we kind of want to jab at Mullen on this show for taking vacations when everybody else is out recruiting, as a human being, as a man, as a family man, I don't knock him for that at all. I mean, we're just talking football here, and that's just kind of the way the discussion is. But this is a tough job we're talking about. And there's a reason, Dave, that, I mean, you're good at what you do. And I'm, I think I'm pretty good at what I do. But there's a reason we don't get paid $7 million a year. You yeah. know, we, we need somebody that's going to come in there and be relentless. And it's going to be a round-the-clock job. It's going to be a recruiter die 24-7, 365. And Napier kind of reeks of a guy who wants to do that. Uh, he's not the only one that's being mentioned that, that does. But he looks like he wants to make a mark. I think he's the kind of guy that wants to see if his commitment and process can can bring the same kind of results in the SEC as it can at, at, at Louisiana. Uh, and so that's why – that's really all I can ask. I don't, I don't like – in these hires, that was like the one thing I didn't see with Mullen when he was brought in. I mean, we talked about that. You know, that's in the past. But uh, I want a young up-and-comer that's hungry and it's going to get out there and do what it takes to win because that's what needs to be done. Uh, Bill, so let's get into what you shared uh, a bit today. We'll get into these candidates and the recruiting side of it, and we'll start with Billy Napier. But tell me, uh, first of all, like lay it out for us. Why did you look at the formula that you put out as far as when these guys came in, bump classes, how important that bump class is uh, for, for, for a coach, and now kind of how they are you know, relative to their peers uh, in, in how they're recruiting and how they started out their careers in recruiting? Yeah, first of all, for I'm going to get into like bump class stuff. Uh, I, I'd reference an article I wrote about three years ago when I first started identifying some of the recruiting problems with Dan Mullen. If you go to Will Miles' website, Read and Reaction, or you can search for Bill Sykes, the five-star nerd, breaks down the current state of Gator recruiting. Um, you'll kind of get into some of the details of why bump classes are important. Basically, what that means is when the first co when coach first comes in, he's got like a month to piece his recruiting class together. And anybody that thinks that the 2022 Gator – recruiting class is going to be top five is just going to be sorely disappointed because there's just not time to go out and get your guys. The cycle is almost over. But when you enter that, that next full cycle, uh, you in, enter this magical time when all the negative recruiting, all the bad things that the coaches say about you don't matter. You have no results on the field that you have to defend. It's just vision casting. And that's where salesmen that go out and hire good staffs can thrive. And you, when you look back at SEC champions in the recent years, the bump classes have been foundational to their successes in winning the conference. They produced three or four different Heisman winners. It's a, it's a critical time. Um, so we need a guy that can come hit the ground uh, running and recruiting uh, to make that happen quickly, get that staff together, go get his quarterback, whoever that may be, and, and start building out. That the answer you gave was just about the bump yeah, class. Yeah, cause the, yeah, because yeah, that's what we'll – because bump class is a huge part of this. And so before we go further in, into that, because that goes into something else you've always done a lot of research in, the bump class is very instrumental. Uh, guys, guys who are winning championships, they're winning it early in their career. They're winning it early in their, in, in, in their, in their well, you know, in their new jobs. Yeah, here, here's a, a fact, and I've thrown this out a few times, but since Steve Spurrier won his first SEC title at Florida, uh, only two coaches – since then, we're talking, what, 30 years, have gone on to win their first SEC championship at a school after year three. Only two. That was Phil Fulmer in 97, and I believe he had a number one overall recruiting class. 
And that was also Tommy Turberville at Auburn in 2004. And he had a five-star quarterback. Again, they followed the same formula recruiting wise, just not timing wise. But even then winning championships is a very fast process and result. The, the idea of long-term rebuilds of, you know, we're Clemson, we're going to do this and I'm going to change what really happened with Clemson to fit my narrative. Forget all that. Don't listen to people to tell you that the next guy's going to come in and more than likely, He's going to win. He's going to recruit fast and win fast if he's going to do it. So it's going to be imperative for the next coach to avoid the mistakes of both McElwain and Mullen. Get that elite recruiting staff right away. Don't turn away Jawan Sider and hire Greg Knox. Don't bring in John Hevesy. Don't hire four bum off-field staffers that are going to cause you all kinds of problems off the field. Get that recruiting staff going. Land a big bump class. At least get it by year three. That rarely happens, but They've got to get primed to make a move within three seasons. You're going to know. You're going to know probably within three seasons if this next guy's the guy, and he'll probably get year four before he's out, or maybe he is the guy and stays ten years. That's just the way it works. Mm-hmm. And that's why you know a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, Florida's become the new Tennessee. They're rotating coaches every four years." You get it till you find it. I'm sorry. Hey, you know, you know when the last time was Alabama hired a guy that went more than four years without a championship? <laughs> It was Harold Drew in 1947. Thank you. That's how you get Bear Bryant. That's how you get Nick Saban. You keep firing him until you find him. Yep. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Yep. <laughs> I completely agree. That does not scare me in the least. I, it's, you know, it's not my fault Tennessee kept getting the hire wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I, whatever. And, and here's the thing. What were they supposed to do? Keep Derek Dooley just because, oh, we wanted to keep a coach around for longer than three or four <laughs> years. So we're going to keep Derek Dooley. That's not how it works. Yeah. I mean, and the long term rebuild. They, they like found a better. Point. Now, don't get me wrong. Butch Jones wasn't a great coach, but they found a better coach. They found sure. a. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you keep doing it till you find them. That's right. And they've got other problems, man. They're sandwiched in a weird yeah. part of the country where they have to dip into North Georgia to survive in recruiting or go north to Ohio or over into Alabama. And that's just tough sledding these days. It's it's not like Florida where, you know, Florida can conceivably carve out a niche even if Alabama is wreaking havoc in the state, even if Georgia is wreaking havoc in the state. They should still be doing much better. And so – Whatever Florida, if Florida becomes Tennessee, so be it. But they got to keep firing until they find the guy. That's just the reality of college football. And you know what? We're not talking about some humanitarian disaster. We're sending millionaires off into retirement. So <laughs> let's all feel charitable for a moment about that. <laughs> uh, Bill, let's get into uh, th- this list you put out there and, and a lot of these candidates here. Let's start right here with Billy Napier. We just got through talking about him. Uh, I want you to go through the research you've done for him. Yeah, basically what I did, uh, composite rankings. Hold on, Bill. Hold on. If you're watching, uh, if you're listening to the podcast version, if you want to go look at the YouTube version, uh, they, I have these stats uh, laid out in graphic form. It'll be much, a little bit easier to follow, uh, but we'll let Bill, uh, you know, go go through here uh, and and explain it the way through. But YouTube does have uh, the the graphics of these as well. Yeah, basically all I did is I, I took the, the main candidates that had at least two classes under their belt, so that excludes. Um, Mel Tucker uh, and Dave Aranda, just because they've got only got one. And since those transition first classes typically are bad, it's hard to do any kind of real analysis there. But I took everybody else and I pulled all the composite data that goes back to 2002 for the schools they're currently at. And then I got the national class rankings for each one of those to take a look at the impact of these candidates that Florida is considering on their, their current schools recruiting as it pertains to class rankings in history, just to find out if it got better when they were there and by, by how much. And it, it turns out that several of these guys really did make some big impacts where they're at now to the point it looks like it's the, the coach, not just the circumstance. All right. And we got Billy Napier's uh, numbers here since he started in uh, 2018. Yeah. Billy Napier, what you got to understand about him is that he came into a program that had never had a 10 win season. Uh, he now has all three of, of the program's 10 win seasons. They had averaged a class ranking of 99th since 2002. If you kind of cut that off to more of a modern year uh, where the the rankings are a little more solid, where there's complete data, and say from 2010 to present, uh, Louisiana averaged a class ranking of 100. Since he's been there, that's improved to 83. uh, The best class that the school had ever had prior to his arrival was 78. Well, his best is 69. And so you're you're talking about a a significant – um, 
a significant improvement. And not to mention that his bump class that we keep talking about here, his second group, um, at the time, that was the best one ever. That was ranked 77th. He's gone on to improve that twice. Two years later, ranked 69th. Um, and then this year right now, they're around 75. So it looks like he's not only creating a flash in the pan burst from his bump class, he's also sustaining these improvements, which tells you he's improving their culture and selling talent to come in and make that team better. That's exactly what Florida needs. Yeah, so I had a, um, an, an error there, a 77 on the bump class. Um, Napier's bump class rank in school class is history. I had 17, but, yeah, it's obviously 77 uh, there. Um, yeah, and I know that doesn't sound impressive, but, again, when you're talking about a team that hovers around 100 in recruiting, that's a big, big improvement. And, I mean, you can't expect that guy to go land top 10 classes in a place where – you know, it's like the water boy, you know, they're not, they're not, yeah. they're not going to win big or attract that kind of talent, no matter what he says. Or does. Yeah. And not only that relative to your peers, top classes in the Sun Belt. That is, you know, so, you know, maybe they'll get a championship out of it this year. You know, as you said, 10 win seasons, not winning the Sun Belt app state kind of controlling that conference, but taking the program to an, uh, to a level, like you said, consistently, they've never been. Right. And that's, you know, that's, that's a little sketchy if we say, is this the litmus test for being a coach at Florida? Well, yeah, it's right. not certain, but there's always risk. And you can't see – if the guy was at Alabama doing this, you wouldn't be able to hire him. You know, there's, a, there's a reason he's a candidate. I mean, it's just not realistic to go out and have a guy that's doing that kind of recruiting in the SEC or that kind of championship success in the SEC. So you have to, you have to make sacrifices in your standards at least to, to go get an up-and-comer like that. Uh, Bill, next. Next, oh, name the Lane Train. Oh, Lane Train, Lane Kiffin. Yeah, no, okay, so Lane Kiffin has only been um, at Ole Miss since 2020. And Ole Miss is a little surprising, uh, partly due to Hugh Freeze, but partly not. They had a lot better recruiting average for class rankings over the years than I expected. Um, and, Bill, and looking Ole at this, we also should probably, you know, put out there that these are the most recent – schools for these candidates you know you didn't go back this is only Tennessee. their current schools there's a lot right. of context that we need from this was hey let me throw this together this morning this is just a first look uh to give us a little insight and, and lane kiffin is a great example of why that's important because he's bounced around a lot uh but as far as his recruiting uh Ole Miss had averaged 22nd since 2010 which is really respectable uh, they had landed classes ranked five and eight under Hugh Freeze, who we'll talk about 17 back in 2015 and 17 in 2007 and 2009. So they, they're they like right below the, those true competitors for top 10 classes. Uh, Lane Kiffin came in there with a 34th ranked uh, transition class, nothing terrible about that at Ole Miss, and then had brought it back up to their reasonable ceiling with a 17th ranked 2021 class. And then it's sitting around 38 right now. So not tremendous. Um, and you know, one of the things that kind of worries me about him when, when you look at Lane Kiffin, I love his offensive mind. I love the idea that people will be drawn to play for him. I think we can see that, but there's just so many question marks. He's, he's not known for his apparatus, his process, his organization He's known to be Lane Kiffin. You know, and does he want to be here in three years, let alone five? I mean, we don't know. He's been – guys, I don't think he's been anywhere for three plus – more than three years except for when he got fired from USC and I'll can just, even sustain I'll, success. Yeah, there you – sustain success, maybe part of it. I will defend him. Everybody's going to – well, no, not everybody. Him, he's going to leave Tennessee for USC. It was the right move for him. Right. You know, given his history. He's going to leave FAU for Ole Miss. Everybody's going to make that move, but I do agree with you. Is is it sustainable? We don't. We there's not enough out there besides maybe USC to know if it's sustainable or not. Yeah, and look at it like this. And I know it sounds like I'm bagging on him, and I'm not. I'll get around to that. But this guy, he is in the middle. If he loses no more games this year, his loss total of seven between last year and this year would be the lowest he's had in any two years of his career. So when you talk about sustaining success, if you can't manage less than seven losses anywhere in two years, I don't know, man. And listen, I'm not saying he can't. He could be a grand slam hire. He's somebody that I think Saban might even give pause to and be like, uh-oh, what's this guy going to do? He's just a complete wild card. He could win three national titles at Florida. He could be gone in six months and take a job in Hawaii. 
<laughs> you know, we, I just feel like it's it could be a great hire, but can you in good conscience, if you were Scott Strickland, could you really pull the trigger on that guy? And I just I don't, don't know if I could. Yeah, I don't think the admin goes that way. I think it's worth bringing up, and I think he's down the list. You could Florida get desperate and bring him in. I think that's a possibility. I don't think yeah. it gets there, by the way. But yeah, I think he's got that's major it, upside. I, I don't yeah, want to yeah. sound like I'm bagging him. No, I, I agree. I completely agree. Uh, I was going to go different next, uh, but let me go to Hugh, Hugh Freeze because there is that connection there from Old Miss, uh, <laughs> of course. Now, this is Bill's guy. If everything, if there was a blank slate and nothing off the field as far as improper benefits and recruiting and whatever the heck else went on under uh, under Hugh Freeze, this would be Bill's guy. And I, Bill, I, I don't think I would disagree with you. If everything was clean, as far as a pure football coach, honestly, he'd still be at Ole Miss <laughs> and probably winning games. He probably might be somewhere else at another job. He may he may have got Florida when Florida hired Dan Mullen for all for all that matter, you know, for, for, what, for what all that matters. But here you go, you freeze now at Liberty. <laughs> but uh, this would this would this would be your guy if it, if if it could happen, right? Yeah, you know, man. Okay. I feel like the guy's penalized because they don't sell burner phones in Mississippi. But <laughs> <laughs> look, in all seriousness, the guy screwed up. I, I believe in redemption, man. And I've made a lot of mistakes myself. Not those, but you know, still, I just I love the idea of this guy making a comeback, and I'll tell you why. The guy has won championships at two small schools. He goes and beats Alabama at Ole Miss. He lands a top five recruiting class at Ole Miss. And I want everybody listening to this. I want you to hear what I'm saying right now. Everybody cheats. <laughs> okay. Yes. It, I'm not saying that he's the guy we should hire. I'm just saying it is still remarkable that that guy landed number five and number eight recruiting classes to Mississippi. And then he goes off to Liberty after he's in shame down there. He's got a guy that looks like an NFL quarterback. They're hanging with him with the uh, Power Five teams. He has he last year he led them to their highest winning percentage season ever. Ever he's boosted their recruiting. He wears a visor. I like his offense. I think he could wreck at Florida or get us in big trouble. I'm just saying. <laughs> but it's, it's worth a shot, right? <laughs> yeah, and it, it, just to give you an idea, somebody kind of came at me. Um, let me find my little spreadsheet. I do use them still. Um, <laughs> running joke, running joke. <laughs> yeah, somebody was giving me a hard time because I posted this data, and they the guy the guy on twenty four seven says you lost all credibility because you gave Hugh Freeze credit for the rankings improvement at Liberty um, when they were moving from FCS to FBS, basically saying that I didn't control variables. And to an extent, that's true because this was just a, you know, preliminary look of the surface level. But I went back to every team that jumped into FBS uh, since 2010. There were 10 others besides Liberty. And keep in mind that Freeze, when he came aboard, he improved uh, their average class rankings. Like his years were 46 spots better on average than all the previous years. When you look at the FCS coaches in the last 10 years, only one of them did better. Those uh, those other 10, including the guy that did better, averaged a spot improvement of just over 20 spots per year. Freeze improved it by 46. So he did twice as good as those other schools in the same scenario. The other guy, Chadwell at Coastal Carolina. So you take those two out and the average drops to 18. So these are two guys that are having huge impact on recruiting. He's done it at Ole Miss. He's won championships at two other schools. Now he's doing it at Liberty. I think the guy's still young enough and probably has tons to prove where he could just come in and annihilate, both in recruiting and on the field. Now, is he a process recruiter? Is he a guy that's going to maximize his potentials rather than relying on not-so-perfect things? I don't know. I honestly don't. And if that's the case, he wouldn't be the guy for me. Mm, okay. Um, but I read <laughs> Yeah, uh it has been shared, Bill, from our uh, our good friend Dan Thompson shared it on Twitter. It's very interesting. Beto Line has now removed all odds for the Gators' next head coach. Does that mean a hire is imminent? Yeah, it, it might well it might yeah. well be. There we go. It was uh, shared in my in the Twitter DMs there. So I guess um, we might be doing all this little uh, showboating right here for no reason, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, 
All right, so that was Billy Napier, Lane Kiffin. Another hot name. I just don't. I don't see it happening. I don't see him leaving Oregon. Bill Mario Cristobal. We know his recruiting prowess in the Pac-10 uh, from the state of Florida. Played at Miami. Uh, was under Nick Saban uh, at, at, at Alabama. Got the job at Oregon when Mel, uh, not Mel Tucker, um, Willie Taggart uh, got the job at Florida State, and now on the heels of getting his butt beat by Utah, but. You know, is recruiting at a level that I think uh, is very, very impressive out there at Oregon. Yeah, he is, man. And when you look at what he's done, I, I, I think Crystal Ball's a really good coach. And is he perfect? No. Does he lose a few? He shouldn't. No. But he's a championship head coach. I think he was underrated in FIU and what he did there in building that program. When he went out to Oregon, uh, they were a team that averaged 24th since 2002 prior to his arrival, uh, a national class ranking of 18th. From 2010 prior to his arrival in 2018, or no, 17. And um, I'm sorry, no, it was 2018. And, you know, his bump class, he took that program to one that is knocking on the door of top five classes. You know, he improved it to an average ranking uh, since he's been there of ninth nationally. That's not as many spots as some of these guys, but it gets harder every time you take one more spot up to and inside that top 10. And the fact that he landed a number six class in 2021 is remarkable. We're talking about uh, a state of Oregon that has two blue chip prospects this year. Keep in mind, Florida typically has 40 to 50 per year. I think I added up and they had 13 in all four of the recruiting cycles he's been there for. And you're landing number six recruiting classes. I mean, People go there for Sasquatch tours and granola. They don't go there to play college football. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This guy can wreck. And, and one of the things I do want to circle back to, uh, maybe not this minute, but he's also an offensive line guy. Uh, I believe he had some history coaching that position, didn't he? Yeah, at Miami he, for a long time, at Rutgers, and even a little bit of Oregon, he was a uh, co C and OL coach. So that's a position that needs fixed. I think he just checks a lot of boxes at worst. To me, he's a better version of Ron Zook. He's a guy that just completely uh, changes the game in state and recruiting for Florida uh, and really fixes a lot of what's wrong there. I think he would win some games. I think he would at least compete in the East. Would he get over the hump? I don't know. Would we be frustrated with losses to Kentucky? It's possible, but I think we would definitely see the roster and the apparatus for recruiting improve under Crystal Ball. All right, Bill, one more before we uh, get the sign off on here. And Luke Fickle, I like, um, you know, I, I, I would like this hire of what he's done at Cincinnati. The worry would be coming out of Ohio, coming out of the Midwest where his recruiting grounds are uh, at there under Urban Meyer at Ohio State. So you got that connection there uh, that he could lean on to, to, to discuss Florida if it got that far. But uh, I would not be in the least disappointed if he ended up being the hire. I don't see it happening here either uh, with, with Luke Fickle. But the, uh, if, if he was announced as the Gators head coach, I, I, I would be really excited. Okay, I have mixed feelings about this. I'm, I'm wanting to warm up to him like I am to, to Napier. Yeah, and I see it. I see it. He has dominated in recruiting there. Um, like it says in a graphic, he's their class average ranking was 76 from 2002 to 16. Under Fickle, it's 53. That's enormous improvement. He's got it uh, up to 41 at one point. So we're talking about knocking on the door of like legit bowl team, you know, maybe a mid-level bowl team status. And I know they've overachieved from that. I'm speaking of a recruiting perspective. Um, but here's the thing. When I, when I look at Luke Fickle, there's one question mark, and it's what I call the UCF factor. Cincinnati, to me, is a lot like UCF in that they're both programs that are pretty well-established mid-majors. They kind of recruit themselves at the level they're at. They have a distinct talent advantage and an establishment advantage over their competition. And there's been some guys before him that did really well and paved the way to really put that program on cruise control. Um you know, when, before he came in, you had guys like Mark Antonio, Brian Kelly was there, Butch Jones did well there. You know, even Tommy Turberville was there. And I think they had, um, in the 10 years prior to him, they had seven, seven, seven of those 10 seasons where they won nine or more games. So the question is, if you hire him, I know he has the pedigree, but are you getting Brian Kelly or are you getting Butch Jones? And I think that's what we see with UCF sometimes is these teams that are primed for easy success. It looks great, but it's just – 
I don't know if I trust it. And I don't know if I like the Midwest thing. Having said that, he is a good recruiter. He is a guy that has, when you go to his 24-7 profile, you're going to see five stars. He's gotten guys out of Florida. He's, he's done really well under Urban Meyer. That program looks awesome. I see the upside, too. If he's hired, I'm going to be cautiously excited. And as long as we see him do the right things and coming in and carrying that swagger and that process, I think he's a good candidate. I just have concerns. Well, Bill, that, that's one thing. Before we do sign off here on, on, on this, and I think it should be stated, and I, and I posted this today, there's not the the pre-hire home run. Now, any of these guys can become the home run, you know, but there's not the Urban Meyer. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean the home run always turns out. Tom Herman was a home run. Scott Frost was a right. home run. A lot of people thought that doesn't mean it works out, but I'm going, you know, quote-unquote pre-hire home run, what we think right. are guys that would be there. There's not that that lightning strike, lightning rod, polarizing guy out there. Like everybody knew Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer had his detractors, he had his questions. Would that offense work in the SEC? Would he be able to recruit in, in the South? He was. All the questions about Tom Herman in, in Texas, it didn't work out. Scott Frost in Nebraska, not working out. So you, you, those were the home run hires. There's not that lightning rod guy here. Doesn't mean there can't be a successful one. No, and that's, you know, and that was one of the things that people were saying before Mullen as far as, oh, who are we going to get? You don't know who you're going to get. You didn't know yeah. when you were going to get with Urban Meyer. Yeah, I mean, okay, maybe Steve Spurrier knew he won an ACC championship at Duke, but then again, that conference still sucks. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just never really know, and this is part of the fun. You just have to, every three to four years, you have to say, is this guy recruiting? Is this guy winning? If he is, let's roll. If he's not, let's get the next guy. That's part of college football if you're chasing championships. You know, one of my favorite quotes in life, Ben Stein says, the first step to getting what you want, figure out what you want. You know, and if Florida wants to be an SEC championship winning program, this is the way it goes. And I'm excited. I mean, I'll be honest, I really wasn't that excited um, with Mom. I didn't know he yeah, was going to I was, I, was I was much more excited than you, yep. Yeah, I, I'm not saying – it was a legit hire. It was good, sound reasoning. But this one has a little more pizzazz if they hire one of these guys we're talking about because you're kind of – you're talking about guys with real recruiting upside. The thing we finally know, this is what's got to happen. They're good coaches too. But we see we're chasing upside with these names. Now, heck, maybe they go out and hire Brent Venables. I don't know. You know, <laughs> but, but – you know, or who knows, but I really do. I would be pretty excited about any of the names we've mentioned, even Lane Kiffin, because that guy won't be boring one way or another. It is not going to be, we're not going to have press conferences like we've had lately, <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but no, I, this is a good time, man. This is, this is a lot of fun to me. And I, I love this time because for about 15 minutes, I get to be the good guy <laughs> until that guy lands like a number 18 bump class and then they all are going to say i'm the insufferable psychopath again so <laughs> i don't know now we've, we've, we've got it in plain you think sight. we turn a corner i think we got to turn a corner in plain sight i've, uh, I've heard that a lot <laughs> the last uh, few weeks here uh, yeah shocking about... shocking breaking news florida's not clemson <laughs> yeah, there you go we, we, we learned that we have right. we, we, hey we knew that but yeah. uh it, 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 that did play out the old Clemson it's model. It was Live and learn, man. Fun. Yep, yep, yep. All you know, just a little bit of joking fun here at the end. All right, Bill, man, I can't thank you enough. I know we threw this thing together pretty fast today. Um, yeah, like you said, an exciting time uh, for Florida uh, right now in, in the head coaching search. Who knows how long it's last going to last? It may, you know, it may be in the next day or so. It may be in the next few hours or so we, we'll, we'll see uh where, where it goes from here but uh, yeah i can't thank you enough for for, for hopping on and, and getting this done with me today hey thank you man i really appreciate it it's gonna be back and like i said i'm hoping some things change soon where maybe i can make it a little more frequent i don't think i'll get back in the game but uh, yeah i'd like to come on here and hang out with you hang out with will and whoever whatever scallywags you can pull up to hit talk ball with us yeah 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 you know, there's a couple of signing days a year we can definitely get together so <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah I might just right, omit this one though. If it, if it keeps going like it's going, we might just say, ah, we'll oh, talk yeah, next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you on that one. Uh, yeah, everybody, you can still follow uh, Bill. Bill. Bill's in the Discord chat every now and then on, on Gators Breakdown Plus. He's there. And also uh, a, lot, a lot of the message boards out there too. Not as frequent as he used to be, of course, as he said. You know, really busy job and family wise there. But uh, you, you'll, you'll find him, you know, 
when is, when is warranted? Isn't that right, Bill? You know, right now, yeah, the exciting right. time in Gator Nation, everything, all the news that's out there, everything that's out there to, to, to cover uh, in Bill Sykes rises again. That's right. Well, all right. it was we'll fun, man. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, we'll uh, you know whenever it happens. If I if I can, I'll share it on the podcast or whatever. We'll get your thoughts on the hire whenever that's made too. Uh, it don't have to be on the podcast, but you know I'll I'll get your quick blurb and your quick thought uh, yeah, of when, when the hire is, when the hire is announced. All right, that is Bill Sykes. I am David Waters, host of Gators Breakdown. You can find me on Twitter at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown. <laughs>